What's going on everybody? I'm Johnny Brook and welcome back to another Crafted Workshop video. In this week's video, I've got a super simple DIY mobile miter saw stand. I've got a really big construction project coming up, so I needed a good portable miter saw setup and I'm really happy with the way this one came together. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with the video. The first step in building this miter saw stand was to break down the sheet of OSB I was using into more manageable chunks. And having this workbench with a drop down miter saw definitely made this super easy. After dropping the miter saw down and sliding on the sheet of OSB, I could crosscut the panel using my track saw. And this crosscut was at the final length of the miter saw stand, which was 76 and a half inches in my case. After crosscutting, I could then rip the larger piece into more pieces, the first of which would make up the bottom panel of the miter saw stand. And this OSB, which is leftover subfloor material, has a tongue and groove on it, so I first ripped the bottom panel oversized and then ripped it to final width, removing the groove at the same time. Next, I ripped another panel to the same width of 18 inches, and the top panels along with the sides of the miter saw stand would come from this piece. Finally, I ripped two strips, which would be the stiffener rails, which will help keep the miter saw stand from sagging in the middle under the weight of the miter saw. I moved back to the track saw and cross-cut the two top panels to final length. And once that was done, I could rip the sides, front, and back pieces to width. With that, most of the pieces were cut to size, so I could move on to laying everything out. I started by placing the top panels on top of the bottom panel, and then I added my miter saw just to double check that everything was going to fit correctly. Thankfully, the space between the top panels was a good fit for the saw, but I did need to mark out where the miter saw would contact the top panels when turned to its outermost miter positions. I marked out these areas with my speed square, and then I could get my miter saw on this workbench set back up to make the angled cuts in the top panels. I made both of these cuts at 45 degrees, even though this DeWalt miter saw will swing to 60 degrees in one direction, and this was just for ease of assembly. And to account for this additional clearance, I just made the angled cut a little bit deeper on the right top panel. Next, I got the back pieces cut to size, and then I could start cutting the angled ends on the front and inside side pieces, where they meet up with that angled corner on the top panel. Rather than trying to measure this, I just marked where the pieces intersected the top and cut to my line. And I find that trying to measure beveled pieces like this accurately is really difficult, and cutting to a line, especially with the assistance of something like a laser line on the miter saw, is much easier. After making the cut, I could test the fit, and it looked great. Also, I ended up adding one more filler piece between the front and inside side panels, but I waited until later on in the build to do this since I figured it'd be a little easier to fit the piece later in the assembly process. I repeated the same process on the left side of the miter saw stand off camera, and then once all of the pieces were cut to their final size, I could move on to cutting the openings in the front, back, and side pieces. So this miter saw stand is based on a design by Ron Polk, and Ron is pretty famous for the torsion box design with those rounded rectangular openings that he uses on most of his workbenches and shop projects. And cutting these openings can be a little bit tedious, but they really help to reduce the weight of the structure and also open up the inside for storage. Luckily, all of the side, front, and back pieces had a matching piece, so I was at least able to pair the pieces when drilling the holes, which did save a lot of time on layout. So I had considered using a router with a template bit to make these cuts, but since most of these pieces were a different size, I decided to just manually cut the openings with a hole saw and a jigsaw. After laying out the hole locations and taping a pair together, I drilled the four corner holes with a two inch hole saw, which made quick work of this process. Also, I did flip the pairs over once I got through one of the pieces just to avoid blowing out the other side. Once all four holes were drilled, I could mark a straight line connecting the edge of each hole and then cut to this line with the jigsaw. And I initially tried cutting through both pieces at one time, but this resulted in an extremely slow cut that ended up with a pretty severe angle, so I switched to cutting one piece at a time which went much more quickly. After cutting, I was left with the trademark rounded rectangular opening that these Polk style workbenches are known for, and next I just needed to cut this opening on the other five pieces. While I'm cutting the openings, let's talk about the sponsor of this week's video, Brunt Workwear. So in case you're not familiar with them, Brunt produces a line of comfortable, good-looking boots at a great price point. 
and the Brunt boots I've been wearing while working in the shop here are their ring model, which are waterproof, slip resistant, and feature a composite toe. And this composite toe is particularly important because as some of you might know, I broke my toe over the summer by dropping a sheet of plywood onto it. And since then I have vowed to find a comfortable pair of safety toe boots. And these Brunt boots are my boot of choice moving forward. Another awesome feature of these Brunt boots is the adjustable width insole system, which allowed me to give the boots a wider fit just by removing an insert under the insole. And as someone with super wide feet, this was a huge bonus for me. So if you'd like to try a pair of Brunt workwear boots for yourself, click the link in the video description below and use the code CRAFTED to get $15 off your first pair of Brunt boots, plus free shipping and returns. And big thanks to Brunt workwear for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to the project. With the openings cut, I could move on to assembly, and I decided to use pocket holes to assemble the sides, back, front, and top panels, and to avoid confusion when drilling the pocket holes, I first marked out where I needed to drill the holes while the pieces were dry fit, and this made things a lot easier. Next, I got my pocket hole jig set up for 3 quarter inch material, and then I could start drilling the pocket holes, again drilling holes where I had marked for them. Once I drilled all the pocket holes, I could move on to assembling the pieces, which was simple enough. Before attaching the pieces, I made sure to clamp them together securely, as pocket screws have the tendency to push pieces out of alignment otherwise. I just worked my way around the perimeter of the sides, and then once those pieces were assembled, I could set that assembly onto one of the top panels to get it attached. So as you can probably see, this piece of OSB had a pretty good bow to it. So I really took my time during assembly here, making sure all of the edges were lined up and well clamped before driving the screws, and this resulted in a really nice flat and square finished product. I repeated the same process on the other side assembly, and then I could move back to the bottom panel. So as I mentioned while breaking down the pieces for this stand, the bottom panel has a pair of stiffener rails attached, which help to keep the stand from sagging since it'll only be supported by a pair of sawhorses. I first marked out the location of these rails on the bottom panel, and then I could cut the rails to final length at the miter saw. I also cut a small angle on each end of the rails, which will just allow me to reach into the sides of the stand without running into a sharp corner. To attach the rails to the bottom panel, I once again called on pocket screws, so next I needed to drill pocket holes along the length of each of the rails. After drilling the holes, I clamped one of the rails in place, then drove in the screws. And one note here, I ended up clamping this assembly to my workbench, which I didn't realize has a very small sag in it. And this sag was then transferred to this miter saw stand because of this. So instead, I would recommend just clamping the rail directly to the bottom panel, as the rail should be straight and will pull the bottom panel straight. Anyway, I repeated the process for the second rail, and then I could set the top assemblies in place to mark where I needed to notch them around the rails. And this interference between the top assemblies and the rails is the one kind of funky part of this design, but I think having the rails on top of the bottom panel rather than on the underside does keep the whole thing more compact and makes it easier to slide the whole unit into the back of a truck or up on the sawhorses. Anyway, I notched the pieces with my jigsaw, purposely cutting the notches slightly oversized to avoid interference during assembly. The last piece to fit was the little filler piece, which I cut from one of the offcuts. And I attached this piece using a little glue and a few brad nails. And while this piece probably wasn't completely necessary, it definitely gives everything a more finished look. Next, I could flip everything over and get the top assemblies attached to the bottom. And I used trim head screws for this. And I would have used pocket screws here, but I wouldn't have had access to drive the screws in. And since these screws are on the bottom, they won't be visible in the finished piece. Once again, I really made sure to take my time here and clamped everything together tightly before adding the screws, and I also pre-drilled the holes to avoid splitting the OSB. And as you can see, the bow was pretty severe in some of these pieces, but clamping them in place before adding the screws really solved the issue entirely. Once everything was screwed together, I could flip over the unit and test fit my miter saw, which thankfully fit really well. And this saw measures just over three and a half inches from the bottom of the feet to the bed of the saw. And I just sized my stiffener rails and side panels with this measurement in mind and ended up with the miter saw bed just proud of the sides, which is exactly what I want so that the workpiece is always referencing the saw and not the stand. With the fit confirmed, I removed the saw and got the spacer pieces cut to size using the table saw and miter saw. 
I attached the spacers to the stiffener rails with a few screws, and I would double check where the mounting holes on your saw are before adding screws here because, as luck would have it, one of these screws ended up directly below one of the mounting holes for my saw, and I consequently had to remove it. So with that, the stand was assembled, so next I cleaned things up a bit by giving the stand a quick sanding, removing all of the printing on the OSB, and knocking off any splinters. So as you'll know if you watch any of my shop project videos, I hate leaving sharp edges on these kinds of projects, as you'll inevitably catch a knuckle on that edge in the future. Because of this, I decided to chamfer all of the sharp edges, and used a white side chamfer bit from Bits and Bits for this. I chamfered the top and bottom edges of the stand, but most importantly, I chamfered the openings in the sides, since that's where I'll be reaching into when storing items in the stand. Also, I've gotta say, I definitely missed the dust collection on my Festival router when using this little trim router, and I was covered in dust after adding these chamfers. So with that, the stand was pretty much done, but I decided to try a few kind of quality of life add-ons, starting with adding wheels to the stand. Now, this wheel assembly is something I just came up with after roaming the aisles of my local big box store, but I think this should work really well, and all of this hardware came to a grand total of 30 bucks, which I think is well worth it to make this stand mobile. So I found these replacement 8-inch lawnmower wheels, which have integrated bearings and a half-inch shaft diameter, and I figured that half-inch threaded rod would make for the perfect shaft, since I could add nuts to keep the wheels in place. After adding the lock nut, I tightened the hex nut on the inside of the wheel until it was just snug, and then I could attach the whole assembly to the underside of the stand. So I purchased these half-inch EMT conduit straps for this, but they were pretty loose on the threaded rod, and I was afraid this would end up with too much play in the finished connection. And that's when I realized that the strap would fit over the hex nut nice and snug, and this would keep everything securely in place. I used some large washer head screws to attach the straps, making sure I was driving the screws into the sides of the stand so the connection would be stronger. Next, I repeated the process on the other end, threading on a hex nut and attaching that end with another conduit strap, and then I added a few more straps to the center of the threaded rod just for good measure. Before installing the other wheel permanently, I dry fit the parts and marked where I needed to cut the rod, which I did using a reciprocating saw with a metal cutting blade. And this left a bit of a burr, and unfortunately I somehow don't have a metal file here at the house, so I ruined a piece of sandpaper to clean up the burr. Finally, I added the wheel and tightened down the lock nut, and then I could try out the wheels to see how they worked. And to my surprise, they actually worked really well, although I think I'm going to readjust the positioning of the wheels and add a block to the end of the stand so that I can stand the unit up vertically without it tipping over. So with that done, I could finally get the miter saw installed, which was as simple as marking hole locations, pre-drilling holes, and attaching the saw with some washer head screws. After reinstalling the saw, I once again double checked the fit and everything looked great. And one awesome feature of this design is the full nine inches of support in front of the fence, which will make cutting wider boards no problem. The last thing I wanted to add to this miter saw stand was an extension wing, which will help support longer material. And I used the offcut from the same sheet of OSB for the bottom of the wing, but I used a strip of OSB roofing material for the back, which really just serves to keep the wing from sagging. After ripping the back strip to width and cutting it to length, I could attach it to the base, first tacking it in place with brad nails and then adding more trim head screws. To support the extension wing at the edge of the stand, I first whipped up a quick little support block using more of the OSB offcuts. This wasn't really an ideal solution, and I ended up replacing this with a thicker block, which allows me to attach the extension wing further from the end, which would better resist chipping out the end of the wing. To attach the wing to the support block, I first countersunk and drilled a pair of holes through the wing into the support block, and then installed threaded inserts in the support block. Finally, I threaded the machine screws through the wing into the threaded inserts, and the wing was securely attached with the other end supported by a roller stand. And with that, the miter saw stand was officially done for now at least, so I could roll it out into the driveway and get it set up on some sawhorses.
All right, hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. I think this came out awesome and it is gonna be super useful on this construction project I have coming up. So I don't wanna give away too much information, but it is going to be a huge, huge project, by far the biggest one I have undertaken. I've been working on it behind the scenes for months now, and I'm really excited to unveil it to you guys next week. So if you're not already subscribed, go ahead and get subscribed and ring that little notification bell so you don't miss next week's video. Also, as always, I'll have links to all of the tools and materials I used on this project in the video description below. And last, I wanna say a big shout out to all my Patreon supporters. If you guys wanna support me and get some behind the scenes content, I'll have a link to that somewhere on the screen as well. All right, thanks for watching everybody. And until next week, happy building.